Jean Shafroff, and I'm on a mission. Anyone can be a philanthropist. My television show came from my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. Won't you join me? Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. Today's show is all about baseball. And with us, we have a very special man. He's an icon in the world of baseball. He was with the Mets for many years, Ed Cranepool. We're going to learn a lot about Ed Cranepool, his baseball career, and then his life also out of baseball. Ed, welcome and thank you very much for joining Successful Philanthropy. Thank you very much, Gene. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yes. Now, Ed, you started your baseball career with the Mets in when, when you were 17 years old, right out of high school. And then you went on to play baseball, I think for, was it 18 years? And then you retired at 34. Can you tell us a little bit what it must have been like as a young boy from the Bronx being recruited by the Mets to play in Major League Baseball? I think you were one of the youngest baseball players ever. Is that correct? There was only two other fellows I think that was younger. Joe Nuxall was actually 15 when he started. And that was before the rules were changed because they didn't want people to be taking kids out of high school before the graduation. So they changed the rules. Your graduating class had to be out. So I was uh, drafted at the earliest possible age. I was 17. I wound up playing the last two months of the season with the Mets. So I, I didn't turn 18 until November of that year. And, you know, my next year I started in right field at the age of 18. So my career started at a very young age. And of course, it's difficult starting so young when you're dealing with men. Uh, my first roommate happened to be a gentleman that had played a number of years, Frank Thomas, who came over from the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was 35 years of age and I was rooming with him. I was young enough to be his son. So it's quite different, uh, you know, than when you're playing in Sandlot baseball around the tri-state area and you're playing with kids your own age or a year or two older, you know, you have a lot of things in common. But when you're playing against stars that you followed your whole career and then you're involved in it, it makes it tough. But I was fortunate to be with uh, Casey Stangle in the early years. He loved the young players. He used to take care of us. And he actually worked me into the lineup, you know, very gently. He had me go in for defense a couple of times. And uh, one of the guys I replaced for defense was Gil Hodges. Not that I was a better defensive first baseman than him, but he would put me in the game in the seventh, eighth inning to get your feet wet, get the nerves out of you. Because, you know, as a 17-year-old, you're not used to playing before large crowds. When you come into a ballpark like Shea Stadium that holds 54,000 people, and the Mets drew a lot of people back in the early years when the Giants came in of the Dodgers, you could have 55,000 people. And you know what? Your knees are shaking. <laughs> Everything about you is sh shaking. Your teeth are shaking. You know, you got to really get accustomed to that. Yes. And how did you deal with the fame? You were like the A Rod back then, the A-Rod of baseball. How did you handle it at some, such a young age? A lot of people would just fall apart. Well, I was very lucky. I had a lot of older players on the Mets and that took a liking to me and they all worked with me. And it made it easy for me to make an adjustment. The game was not fun in the early years when I played because I had nobody to pal out with. The other guys were going out at nighttime and I couldn't even go into a lounge with them because I wasn't old enough. You had to be 21 to drink. So there's nothing I could do with these guys. So the first two or three years in the league was very difficult for myself. The road trips were lonely. And then later on, we started to add young players to the mix. And baseball started to becoming fun because I had guys to pal out with. Guys like Ron Sabota I room with, Tug McGraw. And then we added guys like Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, and Cleon Jones, and Buddy Harrelson. We all had a mix of guys that were all the same age coming up. And Casey was trying to 
um, you know, mix them in. And it worked out great for myself because I had a long career with the same players. And we really had a team. There was no I in, in, in team back in those days. Everyone contributed. Everyone did some things together. And we all socialized. And my guys that I grew up with, we frequented a lot of things in the winter together. They stayed in New York. And we had a lot of long-time relationships. To this day, uh, 50 years after he got traded to the Mets, I'm still friendly with guys like Buddy Harrelson. I'm friendly with Art Shamsky, who lives in New York. Ron Sabota, my roommate from 1964, and I still socialize. And he comes up from New Orleans. He stays at the house, and we have a great time together. He's been out to my boat in the Hamptons. He loves it. And I'll tell you what, it's been a great ride that I've had. It's been a long time in New York, and it's the greatest city in the world to be, you know, participating in. Ed, you were the favorite of Joan Payson, Joan Whitney Payson, who was the owner of the Mets. And I understand she would not allow you to be traded off the team. What was it like to be the favorite player of the Mets? And were the other players jealous? Well, I, you know, it came about in the newspapers, they were writing that because obviously I wasn't traded in all those years. They thought I was a favorite husband. I guess I found out at the end I probably was for the simple reason that when she did pass away in 1977, I was the only player invited to the funeral. So that must have meant something. I was an usher at her funeral and unfortunately uh, she wasn't there at the end of my career, but she was a wonderful person. She was like your grandmother. When she saw me come into the ballpark at 17 years of age, she really made it an effort to come over and say hello to me. I saw her at the ballpark all the time. She was always there at the first base dugout, you know, and, and just would wave to you and give you a little smile. And she knew the players. She was a grandmother to everybody. She loved her players. And you know what? A real favorite, though, was Willie Mays. And we acquired him in a trade in 1972. And uh, she had him end his career in New York because he did retire in 73. I retired after uh, the 79 season. So I was still there many, many years after that. But we had so many Hall of Famers in New York. It was great playing for the Mets back in the early years. And did you play, play uh, for the Mets when the Wilpons and Doubleday purchased the Mets? Or did your career end? And tell me a little bit about the new owner, Steve Cohen. What do you think of that? I know he spent $2.4 billion. I'm guessing he's, he's in love with the Mets and he's going to do everything he can to make it one of the top teams in the world. Well, I never played for the Wilpon family, even though I did a lot of public relations at the ballpark. I never had any uh, uh, situation where I was involved with them. Um, I, I did PR and we had a good time. I showed up at the ballpark and we had a lot of fun there. But uh, I think Mr. Cohn is, is, is in a situation now where he's coming into an organization that had a tremendous following in the early years. They lost it. They gained it back. They lost it. The Wilpons had some financial problems and I think they were forced to sell at the end. But I think Mr. Cohn is going to go in there. And, and do the job. He was a fan back in the early years, in the 60s. He saw the, the fan come out to the ballpark and support an organization that had tremendous loyalty. And he wants to build this organization up into an organization like the Yankees. Even though they're rivals, they still had a great organization. They had the most championships in baseball. So he feels that by putting money in, investing, and he's coming at a good time, where he missed last season. Last year with the pandemic was terrible for baseball. You didn't have fans at the ballpark. Every one of the owners lost a lot of money last year. They were fortunate enough to be able to survive. He comes in and buys the ball club and he still has plenty of money left. You know, so he has some deep pockets. So he's very able this year, I think, to go out and get free agents. And if he does it right, he can pick up some guys at a bargain because the numbers are, are staggering these days. The player's salary is way out of whack. But I think he's able to do it because I don't think he's going to have the competition. When so many owners lost money and he's coming in with fresh money, you know, along with his general manager, uh, no, you know, over there, he can make some right good trades, 
do some things, you know, with the free agent market and build an organization back up. They have some good products over there. They have seven or eight young players that you can build around. And I think, you know, that was because of the Wilpons over there. They, they did acquire a good farm system. So he's ready to do some things. I think timing is everything in life. And timing in baseball for Mr. Cohen, I think, is just perfect to acquire players at a reduced rate because there's, certain, there's not, not as many owners bidding on the players. Yes, well, with this COVID pandemic, and now we certainly are in a second wave, I often wonder, and I'm going to ask you, Ed Cranepool, will baseball survive the COVID pandemic? With, with fans not really being able to go to the stadiums in large numbers, what's going to happen to baseball? And, and baseball... I mean, we, we all love baseball. I love baseball. And I'm just worried for its future. I'm worried for all the sports futures, I think. Yeah. And I'm worried about everybody's situation nowadays. It's been nine months for myself, not really going out of the house. And, and, and I'd love to be out, and, you know, visiting people and doing different things. But how about the other people that are in business? This has been a terrible sit situation that we've all gone through this 10 months has taken its toll on everybody, you know, by not being able to, you know, visit your family, not being able to go out, restaurants, socializing. This has been terrible. So baseball, you know, is going to have a tough time surviving without fans, but every sport is doing the same thing. It's just a matter of how deep the pockets are of the owners, because how long can you survive without the fans? And that makes it tough for everybody. It's a great game. But stand, you still need people in the stands. It's not the same playing the game without people. TV That's is true. tremendous, but you need the enthusiasm of the fans and the interaction of the people going to the stadium. And I don't know if spring training is even going to start on time. We still have a few months to go. You know, uh, you know, we do have the vaccine out there, and they're trying to, uh, you know, pass it around. But I think the, the the people that are getting it now, right now, are the frontliners, and they certainly deserve it because they're the ones that are involved. And that's why people like myself, who have some side effects, have to be very careful, and, and the public does. You can't take this lightly. You've got to take yeah. stay, stay close to home and do all these Zoom calls. Without the Zoom operation, I think we'd all be out of business. Yes, and I agree completely. And this has been really a horrific time in the history of the world with so many people suffering, so many people out of work. You look at the lines at the food pantries where there used to be a hundred people in New York City on a line, now it's a thousand people. It's a real nightmare. And of course, quarantining at home is not a lot of fun. I know it's very difficult for someone like me who's so social and being on the board of a hospital, I know how important our frontline workers are, our healthcare workers, but everybody's important and everyone has to watch and thank God we have this vaccine. Ed, I understand you had some health issues and you needed a kidney transplant and that happened a year ago and the headlines in all the New York newspapers everywhere was Ed Cranepool getting a kidney transplant. How are you doing now? And I'm, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And I understand the kidney transplant took place at Stony Brook Hospital out on Long Island. Tell us a little bit about that. And what, would, what advice can you give to some of our viewers who maybe don't know that they're having a problem and maybe are headed in that direction? Well, I had a number of problems. I started out as a diabetic, and that's where all your problems start. It's, it's a silent disease that creates all your, your side effects and all the problems. And for 40 years, I was a diabetic, and it did affect my kidneys. And both of them really uh, went out on me, unfortunately. My numbers got so low where I was looking for a kidney, and I was very fortunate being in New York to get an awful lot of publicity surrounding it. But you have over 100,000 people nowadays that are waiting for a kidney. And, uh, you know, you have to be very fortunate to get a match. You first, you know, obviously you start with your family and you find out who's going to be a match. And uh, if you have the numbers and they don't match up, you got to go on the outside world. And I was very lucky 
to be able to solicit a kidney. And because of the publicity of playing for the Mets, their participation in helping me acquire it through the newspapers and stuff like that, we reached out and we did find a, a donor. And it became a, a, a wonderful story. Uh, Stony Brook did a, a fabulous job out there. My Dr. Darris, uh, he gave me a call one day and said, I have a donor for you. And uh, we had a meeting and of course we suggested when it was going to take place. But he said, you know, I have something that's even better. I have another gentleman and my donor happened to be a police officer who wow. wanted to donate a kidney. And he didn't care who it went to, but he wound up giving it to me. But there was a fireman that was trying to get a kidney and his wife was trying to give her kidney to her husband to, to save him. He had been on dialysis about three and a half years. Well, my doctor said, you know, we can do something wonderful. We can have four people involved in your kidney transplant. Ed. And I said, how do you do that? He said, well, your donor is a perfect match for the fireman. And the fireman's wife happens to be a perfect wife, uh, match for yourself. Would you mind making a swap? I said, me, I could care less who I get. And my guy was a 40-year-old gentleman that was in great shape. And uh, we talked him into it. The doctor talked him into giving it to uh, the fellow Al, who's a fireman, and his wife, Debbie. She said, that, well, they said, would you give Ed your kidney? So she said, by all means, because she was not a match with her own husband. So we had four people at the same time, two went in earlier to donate their kidneys. And Al and myself were waiting in the, the wings. And uh, when they were finished with the two kidneys, we rushed in. And the four of us were all together in the hospital floor. And we all left the hospital, you know, at the same time on Saturday, four days after operation or five days afterwards. And we've been friends ever since. And it's a tremendous feeling you get. You have a, a different family, you have an additional family. And, but this year has been a tough year because it's been 18 months. I feel great. They've done a wonderful job at the hospital. So anyone that uh, is struggling with kidney disease, there's always a chance. Don't ever give up. You have to stay positive. It's the same way with diabetes. I was a diabetic for, and I still am for 40 years. You can't give up these diseases, the silent diseases. And, uh, you know, this pandemic has been tough on everybody, you know, because you can't get to the hospitals, you can't do certain things, but I was very lucky. I feel great, you know, and, and the kidney is working fine and knock on wood, everything seems to be going good. So I do a lot of work now for the Kidney Foundation. I do a lot of work for diabetes and, you know, it keeps you in the limelight keeps you out there and if you can help one person out there and that's all you're looking to do and, and there's been some tremendous organizations that have done a lot of things for me in the last couple of years and you have to give back in this world and that is an incredible story to share with our viewers and when i think about all the people involved in this extraordinary kidney transplant i think of living angels and i have to thank all of those individuals and everyone who's willing to give an organ for another human being. You are living angels and thank you so much. And Ed, thank you for sharing this story. You told me earlier before this interview that you speak in front of groups that Stony Brook has you connected with to discuss your kidney and, and your health situation. and. As you said, it is so incredibly important to give back, and I'm so glad you're involved in doing this. And for all of our viewers, we are with Ed Cranepool, an icon from the New York Mets. He was a top, top player back in the 60s and 70s, became a ball player right out of high school from the Bronx at the age of 17, and he played till the age of 34. And then he became an actor. And I think you were a stockbroker too, weren't you? I was back in the early years. I, I, I love the stock market. I still participate in it. I still have fun with it, you know, as an investor. And, and uh, you know, I've done a lot of things in my life and most of it's been good. And I've been very fortunate now to still be healthy at the end. And, uh, you know, I love going to the Hamptons in the summer. That's my second home and uh, I enjoy it. And it's great to be in New York. 
I have another question. As I mentioned earlier, you are the a you are you were the a rod of your time, and just what do you think of the big salaries that the ball players are getting today? Do you think that they're too much, or what's your feeling on that? I know back when you were playing, those salaries didn't exist. And what what are your feelings? I just think that uh, you know timing is everything in life. You know. I wish I could be playing today. Obviously, I played 18 years, and uh, financially, you're set for life. Uh, the numbers, they don't make any sense to anybody. Nobody should get that kind of money to hit a baseball or throw a baseball, but it's a matter of supply and demand, and if you can do it, you know, more power to you. Obviously, the players, you know, it's it's one in a million. You know, the numbers are, are so, so against you making it to the major leagues, but you know, I, I, the players today have it made. They, they, I wish they appreciate it. They give back. A lot of them do, but a lot of them forget where they come from, you know. And I think so, I see a lot of players that are making these tremendous salaries giving back, whether it be a basketball player or a football player. I think they're finally giving back to the public because they're the ones that support the players and idolize them. And so if you can help somebody along the way, it's a tremendous feeling. You know, you don't you don't get anything money-wise, monetarily from it, but deep down to know that, uh, you know, you can help somebody else survive. Look at myself, without Debbie coming forward and giving up an organ, you know, you're not going on the shelf to get a kidney or another organ. You're getting it from a live donor and they're doing without to, to help you along the way. So, you know, you can't do enough for those people that are willing to do that. She had a particular reason. Uh, she helped her husband, but we're all looking for it. So there are many, many people that to go out and do it. There's another group in Brooklyn that started with myself, a group called Renewal. That was great. They brought me in. It's a Jewish organization, you know, and, uh, you know, they helped me out and soliciting a kidney. They were trying for months and they actually had a kidney just about the same time that I finally finalized my organ donor. And uh, it's amazing the people that are willing to give up an organ to help someone else. So anything I can do to give back, you can call me anytime. Well, thank you, Ed Cranepool. And thank you for your words of wisdom. And for all of our viewers, remember when you give, you get. If you want to be a philanthropist, obviously, if you have deep pockets, you have an obligation to give your money. But for those of you who can't write a big check, and right now there are so many problems in this world, you can give your time and your knowledge, and you can lend a helping hand. Today's show was with Ed Cranepool, former New York Mets superstar. I'm Jean Shafroff, your host. Thank you very much for joining us, and I'll see you next time.